Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you. I want some feedback. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just standing on all existing protocols, it's um, it's a privilege to share this day with um, the the chair of the group, chair of Nigeria, um, the CEO of management of MTN, and our dear partners and. Um, board members of the Nigerian Economic Summit group. My goal this morning, or my assignment this morning, is to jump into a macro story. With every story, you want to have a perfect story, if you can. Um, and if we were going to look at a perfect story, do you mind me stepping away from this? If, you, if we're going to look at a perfect story, it would likely, on macro, it would likely look like this. If we were looking for an ideal macro scenario or picture or story for Nigeria that we would all like to tell, right? It would be one that was high and stable economic growth. It would be one that um, had favorable current account balance stable exchange rates, right? It would be one that had low inflation and stable price levels. It would be one that had low unemployment. And practically every development agenda in Nigeria, at least um, in the current democratic experiment, 1999 to date, which also kind of accentuates the celebration of the birth of the liberalized telecommunications sector, has had these as the perfect story that Nigeria would like to tell. Whether you look at um, the needs strategy, the vision 2020, um, I, I think Chair <laughs> Undukwe was, a, was a, the EBC or the NCC between the needs and the vision 2020 story. Then we went to seven points agenda. I think you were on your way out at seven points agenda. And we dived into transformational agenda. We did change agenda and pivoted to economic recovery and growth plan. And then from there to, um, what, are, what, what are we at now? We are at now the renewed hope agenda. But one of the consistent um, characteristics of Nigeria in the last two decades is that this has not been our story. But this is the story that we have wanted to tell. All documents, in spite of how they are crafted, all these development agendas I've mentioned, all are looking for this perfect macro story. Now, this perfect macro story has two presumptions, at least, that monetary policy will behave in a certain way, right? That monetary policy will be managed in such a way where with very little government intervention, reserve requirements and policy rates will adjust supply to create price stability. And that fiscal policy will ensure that government spending and revenues are managed in such a way as to meet macroeconomic goals whilst redistributing wealth and income and allocating resources to the sectors that drive high growth. This is the basic theory of change when you discuss macro stories. Now, what is our story? Our story has been that this did not happen, as at the end of last year, we were already off the fiscal cliff all intents and purposes. The cost push, demand pull, demand, inflationary pressure was dominant. Monetary policy kept tightening and has continued to do so, I'll come to that. Um, our all sector, which was our top revenue security uh, uh, um, buffer, as it was, completely collapsed in terms of expectation. Interest rates kept rising. External vulnerabilities were amplified. And so at the beginning of the year, there were projections about where we could go, but none of the projections tell a story similar to the one we would like to tell. The story going into this year was more sluggish growth and high inflation rates. And as you can see from story against reality, we are way worse off. Now, 
when you tell the longer story from 1999 to date, basically a high promising, a high growth, high promising nation in terms of capacity simply is now struggling with underdevelopment indices of the type that could be problematic. However, none of these are themselves drawbacks because Nigeria still remains a nation of immense potential. Um, so despite of high growth, which we experienced coming out of 1999, what has happened is that because the structure of the economy, especially the structure of external revenues, did not change in a significant way, we were unable to manage um, economic benefits going into the second decade. As a result, we struggle with a combination of high inflationary, sluggish growth, uh, unemployment, and um, some intractable challenges with liquidity. So Nigerians ultimately remain uh, very poor. The dynamics of the Nigerian economy remain strongly oil-led, especially from a liquidity point of view. And one of the reasons why the Nigerian Economist Group talks of structural transformation is you need high liquidity to do business with the rest of the world. Uh, somebody asked me, actually my daughter asked me, what's the problem with these dollars? I, and I said, well, if you don't earn FX, you can't spend FX, right? And, and as long as the story remains oil-led in terms of how we manage liquidity, the challenges have persisted. So you almost see a graph where Nigeria behaves as oil behaves. So it, it, it points to huge vulnerabilities. However, that's not the whole story. The fact is Nigeria remains Africa's best kept secret according to the government that has come into office and I think the signal we've seen in last um, um, May through to date tells a story of where a government wants to go. So currently we're dealing with what we at the NESG call a willing reformer government um, and there are some characteristics of a willing reformer. Some willingness to take bold, tough reforms, commitment to steady the course and then a deep-seated dedication to getting the hard work done. And we're seeing all those things with this particular reformer. The government of the day within the Renewed Hope Agenda projects that it will move the Nigerian economy to a $1 trillion economy by 2026, with a target of getting to a $3 trillion economy by 2035, and, then by and possibly stretching it to $4 trillion. The President has asked why not $4 trillion by 2035. This is an important signal. Whilst, um, of course, Nigerians ask the question, well, it's another good target, right? But targets are important when you're dealing with driving the economic system to drive economic benefits. So, where could this type of growth come from? I'm having a freeze. Can you help me, please, um, directly? So where could this type of growth come from? Um, it could come from a lot of places. But any sector that could potentially drive growth is dealing with a basic characteristic of the Nigerian experience. We critically need investment capital but we remain capital deficient as a country. The opportunities that will shape such a GDP growth requires that we see a driving of investment opportunities like the ones MTN is presenting here in the next two days, and that we see from governments signaling that investments um, will be welcome. Because in, like I tell people, investment is like, a, it's like courting a woman. It's shy. If it sees signals that you don't want it, it's out. Uh, you know? and, and, and so when you look at the combined NSC asset classes, we're discussing about 23% of GDP. And if you're discussing growing the GDP to 1 trillion, something must change in terms of 
uh, a radical new bold approach to investment promotion and luckily we are seeing some of those top level signals from the president so a lot is revealed about the nature and direction of opportunities in the structural evolution of the economy and one of the things we have seen is that the economic enablers remain telecommunications and financial services and the digital economy this is both unique and interesting because that's why we're here, right? We're here because we have placed our strategic bet on the digital economy with MTN. And where we see this going is higher trajectories for these economic enablers as we move forward. Um, when you look at growth trajectories of the 75% of GDP, um, telecommunications and when you add digital telecommunications you know you move from about 13.6 to about 16.3 um, tells you a story the story is if you want to invest in the future um, these are the sectors to watch out for there remain huge challenges in some of these sectors of course in energy it's multi-layered uh, huge amount the amount of work to kind of create space um, for new investments in that sector. Power remains a problem, especially with regulatory and policy gridlock that allows for more uh, generation and transmission uh, with a huge emphasis on decentralized, multi-grid, diverse sources type power. Um, where are the opportunities? We think the opportunities are where the numbers say they are. In agriculture, in manufacturing, in telecommunications, because economic, it has become like an econo economic growth dynamo of a sort, with huge potentials not just for yesterday but for tomorrow. So broadband deployment and penetration, driving value creation beyond voice, innovative growth, uh, petals, um, you know, um, fintech, um, fiber to home, and all of its attendant services in the fourth industrial revolution opportunities uh, plus telco fintech combined uh, pose huge opportunities for investing in the future of course others are healthcare education real estate energy all that can be dig digitally terraformed um, by uh, digital transformation itself so um, when we were responding to the president on his one trillion dollar economy, one of the questions the NESG wanted to answer is how, how could we get there? We've proposed at the NESG four possible pathways to a four trillion dollar economy by 2035. Uh, one is export diversification and a sophistication strategy where Nigeria is creating more complex products. Nigeria is one of the lowest economic complexity uh, countries in the world. In other words, we export low economic value added products to the rest of the world. 90% of it is um, petroleum, um, crude petroleum products um, uh, and gas. Um, the, second, the second strategy or pathway is an innovation and digital transformation strategy. And um, here basically is to be known as the center for birthing and scaling innovation around Africa and the world. And the third pathway is a subnational economic integration strategy, which is fire the states. Um, so rather than the states coming basically to Abuja for uh, federal allocation alone, let each state go back and look at a re renegotiated re productivity model where states are contributing in terms of the actual um, um, export revenues. Um, so these are potentially where Nigeria could go, but one of these strategies ties very closely um, to the strategy of um, MTN and um, the leaders of the digital transformation of Nigeria. And we think that that is the way forward in terms of investment opportunities. Now, in closing my talks this morning, some issues remain if macro stability will happen. The first is that monetary policy has to become predictable. Uh, and predictable in certain ways. Um, we need to see a more competent management of the float regime to create price stability. 
We need a financial systems integrity that shows consistency, reliability and predictability. And for that to happen, monetary policy transparency and accountability, um, which we didn't see for many years and we've started to increasingly see, has to be a thing. On the fiscal side, we need to see a better management of national liquidity, um, especially in terms of external and internal um, uh, um, liquidity uh, strategies. Um, asset optimization is crucial. Most of Nigeria's national assets are not flogged in such a way as to drive real liquidity, and that liquidity will be required um, for that $1 trillion economy. Uh, we need to better manage our sovereign risks. Um, if you look at some of the reports, the J.P. Morgan, uh, Fitch, a couple of the international uh, um, uh, um, reports, the Economist Intelligence Unit reports, etc. One of the big concerns is how we are managing our sovereign risk is not giving enough confidence, both in terms of revenue uh, uh, risks, expenditure risks, debt risks, uh, etc. And overall, fiscal transparency and accountability of the system will give our external account and domestic market the confidence it needs for a boost. We have strong commitments from um, the Minister of Finance, the CBN Governor, that this will be the case. Um, they were with us um, about um, two weeks ago now, and these were the commitments they made. So because these were the commitments they made, um, distinguished um, investing community, ladies and gentlemen, um, any uh, NESG thinks that the future is bright with this set of reformers and we should all join them in making uh, economic stabilization possible in 12 months and then growth possible in the medium term. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so I, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, why you were presenting, I, I saw a line that, that caught my attention. You said, in spite of Nigeria's economic growth, Nigerians are still poor. Do you want to drill down this? Yeah. Um, so one of the readouts of the first decade of Nigeria's economic trajectory was um, we, when we had high growth, when we had high growth in the first decade, we actually were struggling with low jobs um, and um, low, low inclusion um, in the economy. In fact, what that birthed was that by the seventh year of our first decade of growth, Nigeria went back to develop um, something we called the National Job Creations Plan because most of the, the growth in the first decade was jobless growth. And um, we haven't caught up. So if you think about the first decade being jobless growth, and that's when we were growing, and then you think of the second decade that was <laughs> um, low growth, two recessions, one pandemic, um, we created 133 million multidimensionally poor Nigerians by the end of last year. So, one of the challenges with the structure of the Nigerian economy, even when it was growing, was that it was not inclusive. So, one of the great things about the sectors that have growth trajectory is that they can all be labor intensive. In other words, they can create more jobs. But to create more jobs, we must deal with the capital deficiency. You must, it's investments that drive opportunities, it's opportunities that create jobs. And it's jobs that leave people out of poverty. There is no poverty reduction strategy, social protection, social investment that is sustainable by itself. So the government needs to shift in the short term from the social protection investments to actual creation of jobs, because it's jobs, high elasticity jobs that lift people out of poverty. And um, that hasn't happened in the last decade. Uh, you, you alluded to it, and the CEO of MTN also alluded to it, the removal of first, first, uh, subsidy. Let's just close our eyes and imagine that that military refinery starts work now. And then suddenly there's investment flows 
and we have the sovereign wealth fund working. Production of oil on the rise. What impact do you think this could make on our macro story? Incredible impact. In fact, when many um, analysts um, looked at the assumptions of world subsidy removal, several indicators and factors were considered. One factor was local refining capacity, right? That the shift to locally refined PMS would happen quickly enough as the market was liberalized to create the, um, to close the gap in exports. Uh, that hasn't happened as quickly. And it's not all um, Dangote's uh, 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 fault as it's uh, peddled. There seems to be a, the lack of sequencing of reforms to arrive where we want to arrive quickly. So for example, um, production remained low. I mean, we were beginning to consider importing crude to feed into Dangote refineries, for example. So there are a sequence of economic reforms that must be coordinated together. Um, for now, crude oil production remains a revenue risk. It has to stay up. Um, and part of that is not an e economic security imperative. It's also a national security imperative because, of course, part of the sabotage of our oil production is a security threat. But imagine a, a world where production went up right uh, to sustainable levels then you can deal with one existing all swap commitments existing forward contracts creates from space to still supply your local refineries including dangote and then that will have had an effect on the price of the market but that's a, that's not one thing that is a sequence of activities coordinated between several ministries to get there so the thing about um, some of these macro reforms is that you can announce the big one but you now need a sequence of institutions, petroleum ministry, NMPC, finance, you know, um, states, national security organizations, all coordinating in the way to get the same outcomes. And I think when you do that, then the outcomes change. The great thing is oil production is back up. It went as low as 600,000. It's now back to, uh, I think we hit 1.8 sometime last week. So these are good signals that someone is at work. Uh, well, you can be part of the conversation, raise your hand wherever you are, they'll bring the microphones to you. Uh, our online audience already asked their questions, and this guy says, infrastructure serves as a catalyst to economic growth and development. What is the way forward to bridge Nigeria's infrastructural gap? That's a great question. I think when we look at Nigeria's infrastructure stock, um, it's valued by the federal government to be a $3.5 trillion infrastructure stock, with 75% of the infrastructure being bankable assets. What we need to see is, to, is first, an acknowledgement by government, and I think the president alluded to this two weeks ago, that government will not be able to finance infrastructure by itself. Um, the current funding plan for infrastructure, it will take us 300 years to achieve the Nigerian Infrastructure Master Plan. 300 years. And I remember the President said at the Economic Summit, we can't wait 300 years. So, we need to pivot to a model where we remove the gridlock, the, the policy, regulatory, and legislative gridlock to infrastructure. What that means is that infrastructure must be liberalized. Many of the infrastructure sectors are still overregulated. Why GSM worked is because we had brilliant guys like, you know, Enesun Dukwe, a chairman like Ahmed Joda, a minister like Cornelius Adebayo, who all agreed, let the market run. And many of our infrastructure stock are in bounded constraints that are legal, regulatory, the sectors are not priced in a way that investors can go in and make their money. ROIs are impossible in many of these sectors because they're over-regulated. The way to do it is do it exactly as we did telecommunications. The challenge is when you look at rail, when you look at gas, when you look at seaports, when you look at airports, everything is over-regulated. And you're asking investors to bring their money in. So what we need to see is 
government identifying the binding constraints to this infrastructure stock, particularly the high priority ones, to being attractable or attractive, sorry, to, to, um, to investors, ring fence these investments into clear FDI or LDI projects, remove the specific constraints to investment, put in all the safeguards to policy somersaults, and take some of these projects to internationally competitive bids where those that have the technical and financial capacity to invest come in. That's how to transform infrastructure overnight. And so if we want to see it happen, we must take Nigerian infrastructure as investment opportunities. We must remove the politics from it. I remember we were discussing privatizing refineries a few years ago, and we politicized it. We sentimentalized it. And that's not what you do with infrastructure. Investors don't invest in sentiments. They invest in good deals. And once you make a deal a good deal and it becomes bankable, then investors will bring them on to infrastructure. Do we have anybody in the audience who do you have hands up? Please take my phone. Identify yourself and your question, please. Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Demebi Obiago from the Africa Finance Corporation. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, during your presentation, you highlighted four sectors as the sectors to look out for to see where you have the opportunities. You highlighted agriculture, manufacturing, telecoms, and tech. So I just want to understand and know what the government, or what kind of policies the government has put in place to create an enabling environment to make these sectors not only investable, but attract investment and sustain the stability of those investments and reach the, for them to reach their desired output going forward. Because in the agriculture sector, you have a situation whereby farmers don't have access to seed, fertilizers. In the manufacturing sector, you have companies leaving Nigeria due to the environment, and you have, across the other sectors, the key problems. So I just try to understand or just highlight what government has done or is doing to create an enabling environment to retain these investments, attract these investments, and make the sectors investable. Thank you. That, that's a good question. Um, so, so I spoke about six sectors. Um, in addition to the ones you mentioned, real estate um, is, is one of the sectors to watch out for. Um, but, but to your point about ag, let's take agriculture for example. Nigeria needs to go through an agro-industrialization process that includes mechanization. The challenge is the intervention model to date is stuck at intervening primarily with smallholder farmers because it links to our social investment imperative. Um, but doing so, we have stayed at about 0.2 smallholder farmer per hectare. At that level, most of the smallholders remain unprofitable. Now, because they remain unprofitable, you create the working poor, actually. So there's a type of investment in agriculture that does not create more jobs. Or when you create jobs, it takes people into poverty. We call it low elasticity job creation. Currently, ag is structured like that. It's, it, it creates opportunities for millions, but the millions it creates opportunities for, it doesn't really lift all of them above the poverty line. It just keeps them in the working poor segment for the most. To transform ag, you must have the value chains work, which means that you know our capacity to deliver seed, fertilizer, pesticides to prepared land for these smallholder farmers has to be dealt with as a set of economic opportunities. Currently, that's not the case. Um, and to make it sustainable, it must be led by capital. Currently, it's led mostly by um, social investments and um, um, subsidized um, input sector. Now, because it's a subsidized input sector, it does not attract private capital in a significant way. And if you don't have private capital, as a driving motivation for profit optimization, it doesn't really grow. Then when you think of post-harvest, 65% of Nigeria's harvest is lost 
um, because of bad um, storage. Again, you look at an investment opportunity in warehouses and storage, but, it, but most investors that have invested in warehouses do not have a legal framework that protects that sector in a real way. Many countries around the world have moved to warehouse receipts, where the receipts are part of bankable collateral. Um, we've been unable to get a warehouse receipt law passed in Nigeria in the last 10 years. So what we need to do in ag is similar to infrastructure. How do you make this a bankable opportunity that, that, it, that just allows cap, private capital to come in? But to do so, you must remove the risks, right? Um, so key investments are required. One is remove the risks on land. When will states be able to give investors 15,000 hectares of land and give them the title in six months or three months? It's taken seven years, six years to get industrial agro land. And we're talking of scaling agriculture. When you want to scale agriculture, it's done on 50,000, 20,000 hectares of land. Most of us won't get that type of title in Nigeria or we'll spend many years trying to get it. So the first thing is remove the binding constraints. The first binding constraint is access to land itself. Then, of course, once you get that out of the way, there's security. Um, and then there is just bad policy. So of all the cultivated land in Nigeria, at the beginning of this year, only 25% of smallholder farmers planted because they couldn't find cash to buy input, which came from the new Naira policy. And of course, we underproduce food. So of course, one of the drivers of food inflation we saw in June and July at harvest was low production because of low cultivation and low planting. So when you discuss these things, this is why the sequencing of policy, whether it's in ag or in manufacturing or in telecommunications, must be done by an economic team that agrees on the outcomes they want. Um, lastly is industrialized farming requires mechanization. Mechanization per hectare in Nigeria is 0.4 HP per hectare. You need about 4 HP per hectare to be a mechanized agricultural economy. So we are away from there. And when we, are, as when we are looking for how to attract investment into assembly plants, we're not attracting investors to bring tractors, right? We are attracting investors to bring more SUVs, you know, and more luxury cars. So this is where the sequencing of policy has to match. It would be nice to see some assembly plans that are purely focused on mechanization for farming. The trucks, the harvesters, the plowers are coming in as part of an investment pipeline that goes into the ag land development, that goes into production, harvest, etc. So I think a lot of these things requires a systems approach um, to solve those problems. Well, um, the thing was so good. I feel we should continue, but they just give us time. Our uh, time is up. I want to thank you very much for being part of this. Thank you very much. Let's appreciate him at the steps down.